Now, as I said at the top of the program, we're going to focus today on expanding educational opportunity in North Carolina. First, a little background that's important. In a court case called Leandro, the state Supreme Court determined that every child in our state has a constitutional right to a sound basic education and that the state was not meeting that standard. The case, which is still active and presided over by Judge Howard Manning, has long focused on three key factors that make for successful schools. Effective teachers, effective school leaders, and the resources to adequately serve every child. Now what the Public School Forum's 16th study group sought to do was to put these factors in context. When we look at the challenges effective teachers and leaders face every day, what would it really take to help them ensure that every student in North Carolina has the opportunities guaranteed to them in our Constitution? What the forum identified were three key areas for deeper analysis, and you can find them on our website by looking at ncforum.org slash educational opportunity. It's racial equity, childhood trauma and learning, and chronically low performing schools. Now I sat down with the co-chairs of the study group last week to discuss further. Take a look. Education Matters is on the campus of North Carolina State University this week. We're here in the James B. Hunt Library in what's known as the Emerging Issues Commons uh, here in, on Centennial Campus. And I am so honored to be joined by two of North Carolina's most distinguished leaders in education. We have Dr. Dudley Flood and Dr. Michael Pretty. Uh, Dr. Flood and Dr. Pretty just recently co-chaired study group 16 that was completed by the Public School Forum of North Carolina that was released this week. And we're here to talk to them about the findings and, and what's next. But Mike, I want to ask you first, how did the Public School Forum arrive at the central topic in terms of educational opportunity and, and then evolve into uh, the three areas that you really drilled down into? The, um, the work of the forum extends over 30 years. About 10 years ago, we looked at something called the Leandro decision, and that was to help us define what an educational opportunity looks like. We've discovered 10 years later that we're still wanting in trying to achieve that. But it's more than just great teachers, great principals, and sufficient resources. We have to look at the students. We have to look at what they're facing. We have to look at the culture of our state and we have to look at some structural or systemic issues that are affecting what's going on in the communities and in the schools. Right. Uh, Dudley, you were working on um, desegregation issues uh, more than 40 years ago, uh, and now here you are co-chairing a study group report that focuses on racial equity as one of the areas. Um, I mean, uh, I guess what is your reflection on the fact that we're still dealing with this issue of race and, and, and equity and equality in education? My thought is that we're really <clears throat> looking at a different thing than we looked at 40 years ago. We were actually looking then at desegregation of the schools, and that was a legal matter. It really meant that you had to get in compliance with the laws of the land, primarily the Supreme Court decisions. But now we're looking at something much more intense than that. We're looking at having done that, how do you integrate the schools? The integration is very different from desegregation. It includes a lot of mindsets and a lot of uh, dispositions, a lot of retraction from folkways and mores that used to be in vogue, a lot of developing equal status relations, a lot of modifying curricula offerings and modifying approaches to education. So it's much more difficult, much more, uh, much broader in concept. So I feel quite gratified that we've now taken on that leg and realizing that we completed the first leg pretty successfully, mm -hmm. but the second leg is critical for education. Now, Mike, you entered the classroom about 40 years ago, really the same time that uh, Dudley was dealing with the issues for the state on uh, desegregation. Some reflections on how things were then, uh, what you've seen evolve over that period of time. I think the, the biggest evolution over the 40 years that I've experienced is we're more inclusive. Uh, back in the 50s and the 60s when I was a student, um, lots of kids left early to go to work. We call them dropouts today. Uh, but they had jobs to go to, and they were good jobs. Uh, beginning in the 70s, we began to include all of our children in regular classrooms. We began to try to include all children's families in the schools, not just 
uh, sending there to uh, be educated by someone else, but to make it a, a more extensive relationship. Uh, we've succeeded in a lot of ways, but what I think we have found is that with some of the changes in our society, particularly the economy, it's affected our ability to help every child achieve his potential to the degree that we promised. Right. We know what to do, but we haven't figured out quite how to do it with every child. Now, one of the areas that the study group um, looked at was the issue of childhood trauma and trauma and learning. Now, the research is new in that area, but the issue itself is not new. Uh, those children, many of the children who were traumatized, if you will, uh, were, not, were not taken seriously at that. They were thought to be troublemakers. They were thought to be inattentive, all sorts of things. And now that we've defined that population, and it's larger than we've determined it to be, and we're now serious about finding solutions, how do you give that child the same quality education that you give any other child? Now, over the 40 years that you've been involved in education in North Carolina, you've, you've seen a lot of solutions and, and seen things um, that the state has, has tried to do to improve education. Uh, you know, so what, are you seeing things that are different, things that we should be trying differently than we're doing today? We've had some really strong leadership in North Carolina in public education, and I wouldn't want to omit anyone, but I do want to single out some leadership at the state level in the mid-80s. Uh, Dudley was in the department at that time. Our superintendent was Craig Phillips. We did some work to envision what it would take for every school to have the resources they needed. We called it the basic education program. Mm -hmm. If we had been able to fund that 30 years ago, I think we'd be at a different point in time right now. And, and for the last question, really for both of you, um, you know, what's success look like? You're rolling out this report. What do you hope to happen? The fact that it exists is the first stage of success as far as I'm concerned. You have to define a problem before you can solve it. And the greatest problem I've ever run into in my work is what I call the problem of no problems. People continue to say, I don't, that's not a problem, that's not a problem. To acknowledge it as being something we need to work at, we're there now. At least the report will have us there. Right. Do you agree, Mike? Well, if Dudley says it, I always agree. <laughs> uh, but I'm going to illustrate with a specific again. I think Judge Howard Manning has done a really good job of helping many people understand the fiscal responsibility for what needs to be done in the schools. I think what this report does is talks, talks more about who the people are in the schools, the students and the teachers. Part of our report focuses on low performing schools. We know how to make them high performing, but it's like a hospital or a business. It takes investments and resources. Well, thank you both for being here. Uh, it's important thank work, you. and um, I'm, I'm glad to visit with you and talk to you about it today. Thanks so much. Thank you. Up next, we are going to dig a little deeper into the issues of race equity and childhood trauma and learning with two terrific guests. Now, as we go to break, see if you can answer this question. How often are African-American boys in North Carolina's public schools suspended compared to their white classmates for the same offense.